Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you so much. You may sit where you like, or you maybe you could sit down over there, and then we'll, I'll just make my remarks, and we'll begin the panel. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here together tonight for this conversation entitled California's SB100, The Race to 100% Clean Energy. California leads the nation with its ambitious plans to combat climate change as an urgent threat to the health of the ecosystems on which we and other species depend. SB 100, the bill signed into law last September, of course, mandates that California achieve 100% clean energy by 2045. So tonight's discussion is about this. How difficult will it be to meet these requirements? What are the most important opportunities? What are the most important challenges? With us to weigh in, we have a very distinguished group of people. Sally Benson, co-director, Precourt Institute for Energy and Professor of Energy Resources Engineering, Stanford University. Ryan Hanley, GM of Shell Energy Platform. Thomas Heller, non-executive board chair and senior strategic advisor, Climate Policy Initiative. Jane Long, Kravis Senior Contributing Scientist, Environmental Defense Fund, and Arnie Olson, Senior Partner E3. Now, Jane has graciously agreed to lead the conversation in the role of moderator, but we have asked her to weigh in with her own perspectives as well, so so we hope that she does that. We would especially like to thank Sally Benson and Jane Long, as, um, as well as Audrey Rumley and Lauren Metters from Shell for their thoughtful collaboration and rigor in enabling and preparing for this discussion that we hope all of you will find to be extremely valuable. Um, And of course, Ford Greenfield Labs, especially Dragos Machuca, who has opened their doors to us for this gathering. Guessing that our new guests in the room might like to have a few words about Churchill Club. Uh, We are in our 35th year as the premier independent thought leadership forum, 501c3 nonprofit, with the mission to strengthen innovation, economic growth, and social good. Um, In the topic-centric conversations that we ignite, we always look for what's new, next, not widely known, um, that is under-discussed insights and possible future states based on under-discussed trends that we are seeing today. We really genuinely try to advance the conversation and augment your conceptual framework with new insights that hopefully will be very helpful and cause new positive actions. We convene about 24 forward-leaning, com- forward-leaning conversations across the innovation ecosystem each year. Um, the hashtag for tonight is Churchill Club. And there's a list of other Twitter codes in your program. Very much appreciate your kind attention. And now let's get started and welcome our panel. Thank you so much. Okay, is this on? Oh, great. Well, thanks for being here tonight. And I appreciate all your interest in this, one of the most important topics of our time. Uh, SB 100 was perhaps one of the most visionary pieces of legislation California has put forward and also probably one of the most confounding. Uh, Electricity is and decarbonization of electricity is probably the keystone of climate policy on energy. Until or unless we can get uh, electricity decarbonized, so many of the other things that we want to do won't won't be possible. particular, the electrification of uh, industry and transportation. So this has always been thought to be the easy piece, but I think what you're going to hear today from our panelists is this not all that easy, and there are some very confounding uh, uh, issues that take place as we try to figure out what to do with a policy that basically says go there and doesn't say how. It's a mandate without a plan. And so today we're going to hear from panelists that will look at this from a systems perspective because doing a, uh, doing a single actions without respect to the, the interactions and fallout from single actions is probably the, the worst issue that we face in trying to implement SB 100. So you'll hear from a, from a technical perspective, from a policy perspective, 
and from a uh, economic perspective, how these, or a, a um, economic in the sense of a market perspective, how these things may um, be very, very difficult to achieve. So we're going to start today with Tom Heller, and he's going to take us up uh, to a higher elevation and then come down to Arnie. Uh, Tom's going to look at um, the high-level policy issues and how it fits in, and then Arnie will, sh will talk to us about uh, modeling work that they've done to actually figure out what that system might look like from a, from a perspective of its... Uh, uh, of the actual facilities that are going to be needed to, to make this goal. And then we'll go to Sally, who will dive a little bit deeper into some real critical technologies that we see are important. And then Ryan will bring us back up uh, to a higher level to understand a little bit about how the policy and technology might interact and where, where uh, policy might go as a result. So, Tom, up to you. So a few minutes of discussion, and then we'll open it up. Thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Jane said you're going to get a higher level for me. Uh, my colleague Sally understands this business. I don't, so that's when you get a higher level. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good idea. Thank you. There you go. If that's any better. Um, I'm you start over now? No, nah, I'm used to screaming after 40 years in the classroom, so it, uh, we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, what I think I can say, because I'm probably the person on the panel who is going to learn the most from this conversation, uh, because most of the work that I do is, uh, is global, and uh, I, I'm, I'm parasitic here, trying to learn from my colleagues what's going on in California. So let me try and set the stage a bit and, uh, and respond to some of the things that Jane had suggested. Uh, climate change is vastly different as we get to 2020 from where it was when I started in 1992, a long time ago. Uh, it's been through a huge amount of evolution. And I would say the, the, the principal problem under discussion has changed quite a bit. Uh, for the first period of years, uh, the, uh, the, the main focus of discussion was on um, what, are, what is the, the real impact? What is the science? Um, how does it apply? Is it credible? I would say probably in this room, I hope, and in uh, most of the world where I work, uh, that's a settled question. Uh, there are a few outposts where people somehow are uh, unconvinced of this or pretend they are, but we're not going to worry about those. At least I'm not going to worry about those right now. Um, that changed over time as the questions evolved by the time, for example, of the Copenhagen negotiations in, in the, internet, in the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, and the UNFCCC, uh, by, by 2009, the real question that was being debated was how much more does it cost to do things low carbon or green than it does to uh, do them brown or, or, or high carbon? Uh, I'd say even that question has been substantially modified uh, now. Uh, because largely of, of, of progress in, on the technological and economic level to the point where the principal question that most people are discussing is how do you make a transition from an installed high carbon system to a low carbon system? And the way you could see that question framed is if you watch around the world on incremental investment, it turns out that it is largely green in most of the countries other than the very poor countries who can't afford much investment on anything. Meaning, if you build greenfield, you are going to see a lot of renewables. You're going in the energy sector that we're talking about. You're seeing more and more EVs. In agriculture, you're starting to see a lot of precision farming and various forms of uh, substitution for meat that is occurring. And, and so a greenfield world would look very different than the world we have the transition problem is how do you get from a highly invested world uh, that is built up around fossil fuels to the world that is um, emerging in, in front of our faces? So transition is the problem. Um, most new build is, is in, in, around the world is, is renewable, even in China. If, if you look at the figures, it is mostly renewable at this point. Uh, there's a lot of natural gas that's being built 
and Sally can talk about that better than I, uh, it's largely in the countries that have natural gas, Kazakhstan, Egypt, and um, certainly in the United States. Uh, um, there's LNG, I used to work on LNG issues in China in the 90s. They were predicting about 20 ports uh, built up for LNG conversion. Uh, that hasn't really happened. Uh, at nearly that scale, there are three or four only at this point. And uh, on, on, on some of the other imported gas, I noticed this week that the first project I ever worked on in China, which was how to bring gas from a very large gas field in, in Siberia down to China and put it into the east-west pipeline and move it to load centers in Shanghai and, and the eastern part of the country, uh, the point is that I started on that project in 1992 with British Petroleum, and the first gas flowed Monday. So uh, it takes time to do this stuff. And all of this, I think, is a function of what I would call good news and bad news. The good news is mostly technical and economic. Prices have really come down on a number of the low-carbon structures. Others can talk about that. Um, the bad news, I would say, is political and financial. Um, and by that I mean no one, no country, even Europe where the, the, uh, the, the trade emissions trading system is uh, in the lead, no one has ever come close to internalizing the price uh, for, for the various high carbon alternatives that affect behavior in a substantial way. There is a price, but it, it's not the price that would cause a change in, in most investment. Um, and... Um, I would say also that uh, uh, the, there, the financial problems have to do with the difficulty of creating structured finance, that is, structured that combines public and private finance. Um, and for very particular reasons, uh, the, the demands or the wishes that public finance, whether it's through multilateral banks or through budgetary mechanisms, uh, basically lower the risk for by, by absorbing what we might call the junior position, the, the position that bears the risk first, um, and therefore, and then allows private actors to come in behind with more or less the same risk that they would face um, on other alternatives, uh, investments that they have, uh, has never really been adequately developed, not at the scale that is necessary to build out infrastructure. Um, and so the inability to create the proper price signals or to otherwise subsidize uh, the, the, the build-out of infrastructure is basically uh, a financial issue that remains problematic around the world. So transition is essential. There are political and financial issues that are there. Technically and economically, we've made a lot of progress. And I guess the other things I would say that are big shifts – are in terms of macroeconomics. When we started this in 1992 and up certainly till 2008, 9, when Copenhagen occurred, uh, the financial and economic picture was very positive. There was a lot of growth in the world, and all the expectations were that that growth was going to continue, especially in the developing countries. Um, some of that has occurred. But since 2008 in the developed world and since 2011-12 in the emerging markets, um, the macroeconomics have really slipped badly. The growth rates are low, and, and, and a couple of problems involved. There is less public capital available for this structured finance I, I uh, talked about, and demand has stagnated. And so it is very different to try and replace a coal plant that was built in 2012, let's say, with renewable plants, because the coal plants are completely unamortized at this point. In most of the world, they still have major uh, uh, public monies. On, on, they're on the balance sheets of the state. Um, so we have macroeconomic problems that create public uh, problems in political economy. And the last thing I would mention about this different world is it is quite Asia-centric. Why do I say that? Especially sitting here in California, the heart of the West. Um, it's Asia-centric, and meaning you can use China and India as your two lodestones for this, um, be, for a variety of reasons. A, 
Coal is the baseline fuel. There is not much natural gas that's available um, in, in these countries themselves. There are potential exports into India out of the Middle East. There's potential LNG into China. But the development has been very slow, and it's going mostly into heating rather than into power. Um, so the baseline is coal. So it's coal or renewables, which is different than you face in the United States. Um, the coal fleet has been almost completely replaced in the last 10 years, in these, in, in, certainly in China, to a substantial degree in India. They have some problems right now with the newer coal being uh, not non-performing loans because, the, because of organizational problems. They're still using the old coal. Um, but the capital markets are largely there as well, the, 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 the source of capital to do this work. So these things together, uh, transition, macroeconomics, and, and, and Asia-centricity mark a different system than we had in the past. And I think I'll pick up the rest of it later on, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to bring us back home here to California, which is this broader uh, context <clears throat> is also really, really important. And hopefully we'll be able to tie that together yeah. as we come through the panel. So I'm going to talk about kind of facts on the ground here in California today and over the next 30 years. Uh, my firm, as Jane said, does a lot of power systems modeling for the various California agencies, private entities, both in California and uh, elsewhere around uh, North America. We've done a lot of work on what a 100% or close to 100% future might look like uh, for California. And I was going to also use kind of a good news, bad news theme. So I've got three things that I want to say in my opening remarks. I've got some good news, I've got some bad news, and then I've got some other things to think about that I think are good news, but you tell me when I'm, when I'm done. Uh, so the good news, uh, and I think you already hit on it, Tom, is uh, we're because of the reductions in uh, costs for solar and batteries and wind and other technologies, it's now possible to achieve very, very low carbon emissions uh, for a large system like California. And we can get to 70% emission reductions, 80%, maybe even 90% emissions reductions uh, in California, 90% clean energy in California at a, at a very low cost. That's, that's the good news, and we're in a good position to do it here. We have access to excellent, high-quality solar resources, not as much wind as we might like, uh, but some of that. We have a big uh, bolt grid that we can use to help us integrate all these variable renewables. It's fantastic. It's really, really exciting time uh, to be in the industry to see the changes that we've already seen and what's, what's coming. That's the good news. Bad news is that we can't get all the way to 100% with the technologies that we have today. So we have to all recognize that 100% is an aspirational goal that requires new technology, technology transformation to get us there. And the reason there's people will, will talk about all kinds of complexities about renewables and their variable and all this stuff, I think it's really, really simple. If you look at this week, we have 12,000 megawatts of grid-connected solar in California. This week, it's been giving us about 3,000 megawatts at peak, at noon. Right? Now, during the summer, it gives us 12. If it was sunny, it might be given a 7 or 8 or 9 even. But it's cloudy, and it's been cloudy for a week. And if your whole system is built on solar and wind and short-duration lithium-ion batteries, I'll tell you, your batteries ran out like last Thursday, and it's been like Northern California in during the virus. You know? So that's, that's, the, that's the reality of trying to build a system off of just variable wind, solar, and batteries. We need other technologies to help us. Sally and Jane will we'll, we'll talk about those. There's some candidates. Uh, CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, longer duration batteries, maybe hydrogen storage that you might make with solar power. Uh, there are a bunch of candidates out there. None of them are commercially ready to sign contracts today. We have a lot of work to do to develop those technologies. And then the third point that I'll make in my opening remarks is that, and Jane kind of touched on this, is that it's one thing, and it's a good thing, to focus on how can we decarbonize the power sector in California. But we have to remember how important that power sector in California is relative to all of the other things that we have to do. And that's globally, China, India, we're tiny compared to that problem. Even within our own state, the power grid is less than 20% of the carbon emissions, 
And you've got to ask yourself, what good does it do me to go all the way to zero carbon in the electric sector if we're still driving SUVs up and down I-5 as our main mode of transport in the state? So how are we decarbonizing the transportation sector? How are we decarbonizing the building sector? What are we doing with our industries that we have in California, our agriculture? There's lots and lots of other greenhouse gas emissions that we need to reduce also. And the electricity sector is the key to doing a lot of that. Electric vehicles, uh, electrifying heating loads in buildings, electrifying industrial processes, the electric sector, a healthy electric grid, and a healthy electric sector is the key to decarbonizing at least half, if not more, of the entire economy. Now, the rest of the economy doesn't operate on a command and control basis like the power sector does. It's relatively easy for the state to order PG&E or Southern California Edison to buy a bunch of renewables, sign contracts with thousands and thousands of megawatts in solar and wind because they have a lot of regulatory leverage over them through the way the industry is structured. If you're trying to convince consumers to adopt electric vehicles or electric heat pumps, that needs to be, you, you can't do that through command and control, or at least not very easily. So that needs to be an attractive economic proposition for those consumers and for those industries. To make that proposition attractive, you have to have reasonable electric rates. So we have to be really, really careful what we're asking the electric sector to do on its own and keep in mind this broader perspective, the, the, the totality of the role that the electric sector needs to play in the economy-wide uh, strategy. Okay, so I'm going to kind of do a deep dive on one um, part of the technical issue. And I'm going to focus my remarks on something that is a little more detailed than what we just heard about from Arnie. Uh, and this is the value of what dispatchable low carbon generation is in SB 100. Now you probably go, what? What's that? Well, hopefully by the time I finish my remarks, you'll know what I'm talking about. So. Um, so if we look at the electricity system in, in California, the way we need to think about it is we have power generation, we have transmission, we have distribution, and then we have billions of devices that are actually connected to the electric grid that use it. And when we think about the electricity system, we, we need to think about all of these components. And in reality, we really have this one massive machine that covers the entire West, so in the WEC, the Western Energy Coordinating Region. And it's pretty remarkable technology. And, and to, to make it even more complex, if you think about all these billions of interacting devices, that the job of the grid operators is to make sure that every single moment in time, the supply equals demand, you know, instantaneously. You know, that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment. And you know, if you look at the National Academy of Engineering, for example, they named the, the electric grid as the number one uh, engineering accomplishment of the 20th century. So it, it's really uh, quite extraordinary. But the strategy was is that we would let customers do whatever they wanted. Um, so they could plug in all their billions of devices, they could turn them on and off, and you know, we'd have no control about it. But the clever part of it was is that we could have grid operators control exactly how much power we're providing, where we're providing it. We could turn generation units on, we can turn them off, we can ramp them up slowly or quickly. And, and that was the whole key to this modern electric grid that uh, has made you know, our economy so strong and so forth. And, and it's really created this incredible reliability and also affordability, you know, that we can get, uh, you know, generate electricity or, well, for consumers, they pay more. But, you know, on the order of, you know, 15, 20 cents a kilowatt hour, there's so much value to our society. So that's kind of the system we have today. But what you've heard so far is that change is afoot and that we're, fundamentally thinking about changing the way we generate electricity. So instead of being able to control how much generation we're providing, we're going to have the wind and the sun and so forth determine, you know, how much energy is going to be provided from these renewable resources. And, you know, if we look at it today, I mean, you people may argue with this, but primarily we're doing it for environmental reasons. There's not an issue about energy security, a shortage of supply. So, you know, we're really driven by environment. So, so from my perspective, you know, any pathway to a zero emission grid is actually the one we should be pursuing if we're interested in the environment. 
And, and that goes beyond climate change. It also goes to air quality, which is a, a huge issue, um, you know, even in our wonderful California. Um, so, so this change is well underway. We, over 34% of all of California's uh, electricity that's sold into the marketplace comes from sources like wind and solar, uh, a little bit from geothermal, but, uh, but much of it. And by 2030, we'll be at 60%. I have every confidence that we're going to make that. Um, you know, I think our grid operators are incredible, and, uh, and we're well on our way to doing that. Um, and by 2045, we're headed for this 100% clean energy or clean energy grid. So often, at least in the conversations that I'm involved in, there's the, the sort of perspective or, or supposition that that means a 100% renewable grid. And so when I talk about uh, dispatchable generation, but the point I'm trying to make is that we need another type of generation that provides zero emissions, just like the renewables, but is controllable by the grid operators. So they can turn it on when they want, turn it off when they need to, uh, ramp it up and down and so, and so forth. So, uh, you know, and of course the problem is, we just heard from Arnie a great example, you know, this week our 12 gigawatts of solar, we're providing, you know, only three gigawatts of power. You know, we're really at the mercy of the wind. Um, and as long as these fluctuations are relatively high frequency, you know, over the course of a day or so forth, things like lithium ion battery storage, that's an incredible technology. It's driven down the cost really uh, quickly. And, uh, and pumped hydro, we have a lot of that in California. Um, not much more is available. But these things can help deal with these issues. But again, if we want that 24-7, you know, 365 days a year reliability, we need to think about what are these dispatchable zero emission resources. And examples include biomass power plants, could be biogas power plants, could be large-scale hydro, that's not considered renewable in California, could be nuclear power. Um, they're not so easy to control, but at least you can be guaranteed that we'll be on if you need the power. And then the other one is uh, natural gas plants with carbon capture and storage. And, uh, you know, we could probably make the list a little bit longer than that. So in our research group, we've been doing studies of what is given this mix of power generation sources between renewables and these dispatchable storage stores, what is the optimal mix? And I, I just want to present some results from that. And I don't want you to get fixated on the precise numbers because that's not the point. But notionally, I'd like to try to make a couple of points. So the, the first one, if you have these dispatchable low carbon power supplies, that the annual investments between operational costs and capital costs are half that for the case when you have 100% renewable generation. Uh, and to put that in perspective, we're talking about $15 billion per year investment compared to about 32. You know, so this is you know, serious, uh, serious money. Um, the second one is that if you have all renewable generation, you need a huge amount of capacity to guarantee the availability. And so maybe 270 gigawatts, right? But if we had these dispatchable low carbon sources, maybe we're down at 125 gigawatts of total power in the system. And that has direct consequences in terms of land use. We need about half the amount of land for, for solar and wind. Most of it in California will be solar. And of course, the big benefit is that we can leave wildlands for all the values that they provide uh, and also leave more land for agriculture. And then another point is, is that the total system costs are much less sensitive to variations in the cost of uh, all the technologies we've talked about and so forth. So you have a higher degree of confidence that you actually will know what the system will cost. So I, I'm sure you're kind of wondering how is it that we could need half as much generating capacity and have half the cost? Well, it kind of all boils down to the idea that if you're relying on these variable generation sources to have 100% reliability, that you have to way overbuild your system. You have to way overbuild your solar system. You have to way overbuild your, your storage system. So solar storage in particular in California. And then the problem is in the course of overbuilding your system so much, now you've got all these energy assets that many of them barely operate any time during the year. So it's a very economically inefficient investment. 
So, uh, so our cost optimal mix has about 85% renewable generation uh, and 15% of these other ones. So it's still a renewable dominated system. It's just got some other things. So, so from my perspective that Californians really need to get to work on identifying those dispatchable zero emission sources that will serve their needs and they need to start deploying them uh, so that we'll be prepared to be at scale as we approach our 2045 goals. Turn yourself on there. <laughs> While he's hunting for that, I, I, I'll plan to ask each of our panelists a question, and then we'll move to the audience. So go ahead. Great. Uh, well, good evening. I have to say it's a delight to be a part of an evening whose premise is built on uh, celebrating innovation and climate policy here in California. Uh, not all my evenings are, are like this. They're usually a bit more dire. And... Uh, SB 100, I think, is a version of that. It builds on California's, I think it's safe to say, decades-long record of uh, thinking about innovative policy, innovative legislature. Uh, it's a nice place to be, uh, and, and I think it's a nice venue. Um, Arnie mentioned that you know if we have this 100% target, getting to 90% might be there might be a credible path, maybe even a reasonable path. And then the last 10% might be really hard, maybe potentially expensive. Um, if I sat down and I had a target amount of comments to make in my opening speech, uh, it's challenging through the insightful comments of your colleagues to have 90% of that already covered. And to squeeze out another 10% of insight, uh, I've learned not to go last. Um, and so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to wing the rest of this. Uh, um, yeah, if Arnie said the last 10% is hard, and, and Sally gave us some hope that it's probably technically feasible and maybe even more economical than we might anticipate, it still begs the question, I believe, of should we do that last 10%? Uh, mandates always have the, even when really well-intentioned, the downside of is, is it inspiring the right action that you would take holistically as a society if you had all the flexibility that you, that you wanted? Uh, and for example, if we're staring down that last 10% and it's going to cost X amount of money, if we stare over at the transportation sector or the, or the building sector and we see that we could deploy that money and get twice the carbon reduction uh, that we're able to do, are we afforded that choice by the, the legislative contra uh, contract and, and the policy? Um, and you know, with SB 100, uh, ideally there's a lot of hope. We have 25 years, you know, 2045 is a long ways away from now. Conceivably, California has a wherewithal. If they find themselves in that situation, they can make some changes. But I think it highlights a challenge that is a tension here in, in energy, which is uh, the regulatory structure, the regulatory compact. Um, you know, markets are always held up as something that can be very efficient in solving really big challenges. The common critique is that, except when externalities are big, and climate, health, cha health uh, challenges, externalities are massive. And you could easily look across and argue, like I do, most of those externalities are not priced in effectively. Um, so how do you think about creating structures that allows you to, to accomplish that? Uh, a one-word answer is, is regulation. Um, I'll say regulation with all the, the, the balance and the things that make sure we have a system that works. Uh, and so if we believe in, in a, a form of regulation, uh, I look at California and I see a set of regulatory compacts, uh, regulatory structures that were created for a world that was pre-climate, if you will. The, the uh, PUC, um, Public Utilities Commission, uh, they also regulate things like water, uh, taxis, uh, a, a long list of things that are in many ways out of a different generation of public use challenges. They weren't set up for climate uh, necessarily. I think they're adding a tremendous amount of, of oversight and value, uh, but they don't have jurisdiction across everything. The legislature doesn't have necessary jurisdiction. CARB, the California Air Resources Board, is thinking about carbon, but they don't have some of the tools on the IOUs or the other different mechanisms that they, you, you might want them to have if you started with a view of how do I give a balanced regulatory arm review, something that uh, allows it to influence the market in a positive way. Um, and there are a handful of challenges that I think must change over the coming decades to, to return to that balance. California hopefully reassessing the regulatory bodies, how they interact. Can there be alignment with things like SB 100 that says, I have done this incredibly ambitious, 
well-intentioned mandate to pursue uh, carbon-free energy, but do I give myself the flexibility that I've worked with CARB or people that are looking over the building stock in the CEC to say, can I have it aligned and can I have an exit valve if the building stock becomes something that is societally more efficient for me to invest in? Um, so that's something that we would love to see evolve in California over the coming decades. Uh, and then similarly, you know, maybe with every profession, a little bit more pay would be nice. Um, Arnie and I were, were laughing about how you have armies of ec uh, analysts, economists, attorneys, regulatory advisors, and utilities who go and engage in front of, say, the Public Utilities Commission, who has a, a thin staff, meager wages, and how do they have a chance to, to offer a regulatory engagement that is uh, in this societal interest? So I'll leave it with those two additional complications. Is there a regulatory compact or structure that is better suited for the challenge ahead of us? And can we pay these poor staffers uh, in these agencies a bit more money? Thanks. Okay. Good. Well, I'll probe a little bit. So, Tom, I, um, you talked a lot about uh, the financial system and uh, capital markets and whatnot. And uh, we just heard Ryan talk about regulation. We've got, according to the IPCC, you know, a couple of decades here to squeeze the carbon out. Um, does it make sense to keep this problem in the realm of financial markets? Should we be looking more closely at, at a command and control type solutions? So um, that's an answer I'm sure everybody on the panel would like to look at. In the simplest sense, the types of changes that are being described demand building out a new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so finance is at the, to build out an infrastructure under tight macroeconomic conditions is very difficult, um, um, given the way we have traditionally financed any large projects of this type. If we really could move heavily to distributed energy resources at the household level, at the, you would get a different set of financial possibilities. It would look more like automobile loans or some of the vehicles that we've seen uh, SunPower and others come out with to do the financing because you're running on a distributed basis without much infrastructure. So part of the answer to the question is how is this system going to evolve between the centralized models that we have used in the past and the much more decentralized two-way flows that, that exist to, uh, to, to, uh, that uh, Sally and others referred to. Um, on the other hand, I don't really think it's... Uh, it's a, it's a simple matter to eliminate the, the, the centrality of finance. So let me give you an example. Uh, we can think about this process that I called transition, getting from a system that is organized around fossil fuels, that is optimized around fossil fuels, which means optimized around trying to minimize the variable costs, the cost of burning the fuels, uh, that are there and staying on the grid if you're in a competitive market. Um, when you start to move to a system um, in which basically generation is being done on largely a zero cost basis, like solar or wind, you, you've got a capital cost to do, and then the operating costs or the variable costs are zero. The financing structures that go along with that are really very different. Um, and we have actually see these if we look as where wind is heavily built out in Germany. It was largely by co-ops with some sort of subsidies that were there. When you start to change to a differently structured system, probably the financial vehicles that were well adapted to that system need to change as well. And so as just an example and picking up on what Sally said, let's assume that as the marginal cost of generating energy falls and falls and falls, as, as, as it will when you bring on zero marginal cost structures um, and you build markets around that zero marginal cost provision, um, what goes up in value is the value of the flexibility or the services that Sally was describing that produce reliability for the grid. And we're seeing this happen. But in order to have that happen, the system has to change. In other words, the regulatory system has to be built up around um, basically the value of flexibility. The uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the business models that are used. People talk about the collapse of utilities as, as structures that dominated the, and their balance sheets, which is let, what lets you finance electricity in the past. That's going to have to change. And so are the financing vehicles themselves. Uh, last example. If what we are thinking about is uh, systems, like uh, systems for demand-side management or systems for integrating power that flows in two directions and has uh, a lot of need for flexibility on top of the variable supply that is there, um, you're, the, the, a lot of that is going to be intangible assets. That is, control systems, software. That would seem good for California because California's system is based, California's economy has moved in that direction. So there is a very good possibility that the real advances that we're going to see are a function of sustainability and digitization together. The intang but financing intangible assets is one of the biggest problems that we're having right now throughout the world. Why? Because they're easy to hack, because they can be copied. There's not much intellectual protection for these systems. And so if we look around at what is actually being invested in the world, you see it's overwhelmingly physical assets, like renewables plants. But what's really needed for productivity are these intangible assets. So that means I will shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Jane. the most effective system I have seen yet. Uh, in other words, the finance is going to remain at the center, but it's going to have to be differently structured than it has been in the older system. You want to weigh in on that, Ryan? Yeah, it, and you, I think you also pose maybe a tension between finances or markets and regulation, and are they at tension with each other? Um, they can, but they also can move in conjunction with each other. So well-functioning markets can operate even better with well-functioning regulation. And if you look at California, particularly the power sector, I would say we're actually a far cry from competitive markets based on the rest of the, of the world's electricity markets. Um, you know, we... I think the bankruptcy of PG&E and, and Enron cast a long shadow around competitive wholesale markets, but a lot of access to wholesale markets has been slow in California versus, I think, the gold standard you could call Australia, which is a almost pure spot in, in every part of the, of the world. California is holding back on a lot of that innovation, and it's hurting bringing the prices down. So Australia, when they introduced the ability for markets to participate in, in those markets, um, I worked on the, on the first mega battery. I led the first mega battery deployment in Australia that brought ancillary service prices down uh, by 70% through one asset that was on the grid. Um, it's, phenom it's, it's the type of economic uh, price compression I think, Sally, you were referencing from flexible assets. And then if you look at what utilities models here in the United States or in California, it's also dated if you look to Europe. No retail competition or extremely low retail competition uh, where utilities are the only people that have the right to be able to service electricity to a customer is, frankly, a dated concept, if you look at Europe, where utilities' roles are to manage the pipes and wires. Um, and so there is a lot of embrace of markets that are still left to do, I believe, in California, and that can and should maybe happen with an embrace of regulation uh, alongside it. Okay. So, Arnie, I, um, I know you've been looking at the California build-out, and you made the comment that uh, we, can get, we can get close to zero if we use other resources. But could you talk specifically about the point that Tom was making about these stranded assets and how that might evolve in California if we went to 100%? 100%? Yeah, well, Tom raised the concept of transition, uh, which I think is a really important one. I think the good news there is that for the grid, that transition can be quite natural. So, you know, we started with a grid that was a, mostly hydro, but then we added coal on top of that, and that was our baseload resource for a long time. It was illegal to burn natural gas to make power for a long time in the United States of America, if, you can, if you're old enough to remember that. As I, I'm not, but I read about it in books. <laughs> um, but uh, since then, we've, we're, we're moving slowly and I think inexorably towards a system that's more heavily based on wind and solar and other uh, lower carbon technologies and we're phasing out the old ones and we're doing it actually in quite a orderly way. I'm sure that won't look like that to all of the you know, people whose jobs and lives are disrupted by closure of coal plants and coal plant owners who are dealing with all the financial ramifications of that. But if we take a step back and look at how our power grid is transitioning, coal is slowly being phased out. 
natural gas is being phased in in its place, right? And that might not make you feel very warm and fuzzy, and that's right, but, we, but that needs to happen, right? Because when the coal phases out, there's capacity, capability to serve energy demand during the coldest time of the year when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, that's important to have. And until we have those other technologies ready to play that role, we, we, we need to rely on the one that we have now, which is natural gas. So that's going to be on our system. It's going to play a role for a long time. But we need to slowly phase that out as well. So how do we do that? By adding more and more, maybe not even slowly, we need to phase that out as well, by adding more and more wind and solar. And I think we could do that a lot faster, to be honest. Um, but we still need to keep the gas plants around. We just need to run them a lot less. So that's the nice, smart transition to me that doesn't create a lot of electric rate shocks that moves us towards a lower carbon system inexorably. And we can do it faster, but reliably, and keeps the rates reasonable so that we can use electricity to, power, to charge our cars and to heat our homes and to do all these other things that we will also need it to do. Can I comment just quickly sure. on that? Too? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I agree, and I, I want to come back to the to the regulatory point. Uh, this question of the downside risk, which is extremely important in much of the world, and let me use ex- Australia as an example, since Ryan brought it up. But it's a it's one I was in Australia last week for most of the week with the Reserve Bank of Australia, the the entity of the government, the central bank, whose job it is to worry about financial stability. And uh, uh, in in the system and to try and prevent the kinds of breakdowns that we suffered here uh, in 2008. And if you look at the Australian economy, uh, they are basically major exporters of coal, of natural gas, uh, of uh, iron ore, uh, of food. And they have an infrastructure which is built around moving those products from where they may be found to the ports. Okay, so the infrastructure is built around the export system that drives their economy. They are facing external risk. That is to say, if Japan and Korea, to take the example of where much of their coal and their iron goes, were to move quickly to a low-carbon system, Australia's exports would be seriously hurt. And that's one of the things we spent our time doing, is modeling exactly when and how um, that would occur. California, in a sense, is an easier case. And I think Arnie was right in describing it's a very hard case, but it's an easier case among the hard cases. Because, uh, you know, basically we don't have commodity exports, at, 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 in, certainly in, the, um, in, in this area. I think that the oil we produce is largely consumed here, almost all of it. We have a, you know, I think we're, what, fifth or sixth biggest state in oil production but it's consumed internally. So it's not external risk that we're facing, it's internal risk, it can be managed. The pace of wind down, if you look at SB 101, right, it's 60% and then it goes to 100% in, in, in 2045, which means not only can you amortize those gas plants that are there, depending on how orderly this is, but if you have a regulatory change that puts the proper value on flexibility, on reliability, the prices that those gas plants receive is going to go higher, which will mean that the financial amortization is, is, is easier. And then, of course, SB 101 has all kinds of escape clauses in it. The regulator, regulator is charged with making sure the system remains affordable, reliable, and safe. And so, you know, it, it gives, it, it, it gives some, some play in all of this. So I think that the intersection between finance, the kind of risk you're trying to bear, and the regulatory system that you create to manage that system properly is really the heart of of what Arnie properly described as what we need to do, an orderly transition. And we're doing that quite well in SB 101. The other sectors, that's a question uh, about how that's going to be managed. Um, And perhaps most of all, when we turn to physical risk in California, particularly with respect to the fires and some of the other things that we're seeing, the management looks anything but orderly to me when I look at it. And so I think all of these things have to be 
somehow played in together to make this transition as efficient and as uh, equitable so, as possible. So one, one more question for Sally, and then we'll turn to the audience. So, so we're hearing a lot about uh, reliability. And, you know, I think if you look at the constituencies for, for energy, they're usually economic and environmental and now the, this reliability issue, which is largely an engineering problem. Um, and I, I'm wondering if you would like to get onto a, a, a platform here and discuss how you think the engineers are being treated in this problem, and are the engine is and is there enough engineering entering into how we move in two decades to a reliable system uh, that, uh, that that doesn't harm our economy or cause inequity? Yeah, you know, I I think that that's a great a great question. I mean, I. You know, the, the organization, CPUC, you know, CAISO, I mean, everybody is, are using engineering tools like, uh, you know, capacity expansion, economic dispatch models to sort of look at that next iteration of, of, of renewable, you know, increasing renewables. But, you know, maybe the lookout time is uh, relatively short. When you are looking out over, you know, 2030, 2045, um, I don't think that's the mindset. I think people are looking at, well, what's that next tranche of renewables I've invested in? So I just think that it's really an issue of um, taking the longer view. But I just want to add one other thing. So, you know, one of the things that we all give the impression, including me, I'm guilty, is, oh, renewables are cheap. You know, solar is cheap. Well, and the reason we do that is that there's a metric called the levelized cost of electricity. And, and basically what it presumes is that we buy a solar panel, it operates in an optimal way, um, you know, totally meeting its performance specs. Every bit of that electricity is consumed and we can generate revenue from that. And that's how we calculate the levelized cost of electricity. The reality is that to get value out of your solar resource, you need to put on storage. And nowadays, you can even buy solar plus storage. Maybe that's two hours of storage, maybe four hours of storage. But if we really want a 24-7 system, we don't need that. We need like 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours of storage. All of a sudden, solar is no longer cheap. Uh, but because of, the, of the, the positive narrative, which is really important, we've come to think that, that you know renewables are cheap and anything else is going to be too expensive. I just think that's the wrong narrative you really need to look at the full system costs. And I think that's harder for people to do, but that's what I think is really missing, is looking at the whole system cost and making our investments that are consistent with optimizing that. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's turn to the audience and see. I have yeah. a new technology question. <laughs> okay, we got one right here first, and we'll... Oh, okay. So we've got a question here in the front, and we'll go over here. Over here. Hi, my name is Judith Schwartz uh, from To The Point. Uh, so I'm very interested in sort of a two-part question. So one is the idea of, and, and Sally's sort of leading to it, the idea of accounting for the impact of the changes, not just the cost of it, but what really is the impact on carbon? And what are we going to do about people who are poor and cannot invest in these great systems that they can put on their house where it's as if you said you can only have to eat what you can grow at your house. And if you can't grow enough to survive in your garden at your house, well, it's too darn bad. And I think that this idea of the social compact of universal service is somehow getting lost in this discussion. And what are poor people going to do about when it's cold and dark at night and they don't have access to anything? So if you could address that as well as the idea of how do we know that it's really working to decarbonize? I'm happy to. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fantastic set of questions there, really. Uh, and I'm really glad that you raised it, because I think it's really important. Uh, and I, I think it speaks to what the role of the utility has been and is today and needs to be uh, going forward. Uh, the utility, if you think about it, is basically a big insurance pool, right? Which means that it's, a, it's an entity that 
ha incurs a bunch of costs that are for the benefit of everybody, and through a painful, laborious process, decides who, how much each person and business should pay for those facilities that were built on its behalf. And that process, if you ask any economist, is not set up for efficiency. It is not meant to be efficient. We've been trying to make it more efficient for decades and largely failing. It's mostly set up to be equitable. Right? The whole driver behind allocating those costs is what's your fair share based on the way that you use this common system, this network of power lines and transformers and power plants and everything else, the entire system. Right? So that's the utility. Right? And it's the utilities balance sheet that has financed the clean energy transition to date. It's PG&E and Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric and LADWP and Sacramento Municipal signing contracts, long-term contracts, encumbering their ratepayers with long-term obligations to finance all these wonderful projects that are cleaning up and decarbonizing our grid and deciding how to allocate those costs and who should pay how much. It's not so the subsidies that are in place for rich people to put solar panels on their roofs and to buy Teslas. We're subsidizing that as well, and you know that may be okay for a little while. But I'll tell you, we're paying more for the few thousand megawatts of solar that we have on people's roofs through increase in electric rates, and we're paying for all the rest of our clean energy investments. And it's not even really close. That's how big those subsidies are. So that's not a sustainable world. A world in which we're subsidizing rich people to be early adopters isn't sustainable. The other thing that I worry about a lot is this idea that we should, what do we do with PG&E, right? This is a, an example where the current compact has failed and the utilities are in bankruptcy and we don't know what to do with it. So San Jose maybe wants to buy their share of PG&E. City of San Francisco maybe wants to buy their share of PG&E. So what happens if you start carving up this big insurance pool that today includes Bakersfield and Fresno and a whole bunch of very dirt poor communities in the Central Valley? Are we, you know, are, are, is San, right now San Jose and San Francisco are subsidizing the Central Valley, right? So does that, does that go away, and what are the equity issues associated with that? As we atomize the electricity system, we lose that social compact, and it's gonna, when we lose that equity aspect that I think is really important to maintain going forward, especially as we build all these things and make rates higher. And, and just to weigh in a little bit, I totally support what you said, Arnie. I think that um, the gated community solution the micro grid, grid solution is is not is opposite to what we're trying to achieve, and I, I think that it's really important to understand that it may have local reliability um, benefits, but it, it really is a gated community. And I, I think one other thing you mentioned um, the utility buying these resources; they buy those resources because they're required to by regulation. And, I, you know, California has had AB 32, which everybody thinks is the big climate bill. I think the bottom line is that the biggest effect on climate emissions in California is probably the bill whose number I can't remember passed some 10 or 15 years ago restricting the uh, emissions that can be uh, allowed in any long-term power purchase agreement. So let me I make think that, that, I think three points point. to your question, which is essential. I suggested earlier that the future of this whole question of climate change is a combination of sustainability and digitization. Digitization is going to create uh, a situation where the inequality we're already seeing cannot be solved through the standard methods that we have used. What do you mean by digitization? Uh, by digitization, I mean using information technologies and, and some of the new material sciences work that is extremely uh, fine-grained to, uh, but to make it simple, to use control systems to make this whole thing work, as Sally uh, suggested that it needs to. Uh, in this sense, the answer to the climate change problem is built into the larger set of economic changes that we're having, and they are going to shift the whole distributional question. You start to hear this a little bit in the debates, but uh, of, of, the, of the Democratic parties. In other words, the income distribution system we have is not stable in itself. We can solve some of that specifically through the energy system. Most of it we will solve when we take on that problem in a serious way. The second point I'd just like to, to plant on the transition side, 
Very often, it is precisely the problems of the poor that are preventing the movement toward low carbon systems. Example, um, in China, the bulk of coal is built, not, is burned, not for power, but for heat. They have systems that you call combined heat and, heat and power systems. They are burning the coal because they have no other way to produce heat in the cold areas at very low cost. Okay? The power then becomes free because they've burnt the coal to produce the, the heat that they need for to deal with what people need in cold climates. But then the power is sitting there as kind of the waste product of, build, of burning the heat. And so China does not move to absorb the renewables at nearly the pace that, that they might. So you have to think about the transition side, the downside, on, and its impacts on the poor and on jobs, just as you do. And there are ways to try and resolve those problems that probably would speed up climate change, but at the cost of making sure that you are dealing equitably with the poor. Um, and I had a third point, and I have completely lost it. And I <laughs> well, mind. let's go to another question then. Thank you very much. Rich Peranto here. Um, I'm here as an advocate for hydrogen. And um, what I wanted to bring to your attention since we wanted to talk about emerging technologies is work that's being done at the uh, University of California in Santa Barbara in the chemical engineering department. And the technology that they've created for converting methane directly to hydrogen with solid carbon as the output byproduct. And that technology doesn't seem to be widely aware in the, in, the, in the community. And this is critical for dispatchable energy. And it also is critical because it preserves our existing investment in pipelines and in turbine power because it lets you do the conversion at the end of the pipeline before it goes into the generating plant. Or at the beginning, wherever you need to do the conversion, you can do a direct conversion. I'd like to hear the panel's thought on this kind of technology and how it reduces the investment costs in, in the conversion. Yeah, I, I agree. Hydrogen is a really interesting um, option for um, storage. So, so hydrogen is interesting in that it can be used for a bunch of things. You can, if you can produce hydrogen, you can then later use it to produce electricity with a fuel cell, or you can even burn it. Uh, it's also very useful for the transportation sector. Uh, it's also potentially useful for very long-term storage. So if you could make enough hydrogen and if you could store it underground, you would then have a year-round supply of, uh, of hydrogen. So, so today, if you look at the cost of hydrogen technology, um, it's significantly produced from um, some of these new technologies. It's significantly more um, than the cost of other forms of storage. Um, I think that will come down over time, and I think that's one of the things that we really need to keep open to. Um, but as you say, you know, the methane, when you make it, if you make hydrogen from methane, you have to do, deal with the carbon. One possibility is to make solid carbon products, and there's actually a local company that's actually doing that. Uh, and and they're, what they're doing is they're actually making the carbon to sell it um, as a valuable product in and of itself. Uh, it's quite expensive to do that, and, and if they can sell the hydrogen, they can kind of make the economics tr attractive. But that's not the only way to make hydrogen. Uh, you can make hydrogen from electrolysis using renewable generation, uh, and you can make, you know, 100% uh, carbon-free hydrogen. Or you can also take methane and uh, use steam methane reforming, and you make carbon dioxide and, uh, and hydrogen, and then you could sequester the carbon dioxide or convert it into other valuable products. So there are a number of pathways, and, and uh, I think we should be exploring them all. And, uh, and the one you're talking about is uh, interesting amongst that list. Can I just say, Jane, very quickly, yeah. it depends where you look. If you go to China, hydrogen is at the heart of the problem because you can use the pipes, and it's a heating product that can carry the heat. And if you try and understand why Toyota 
which thinks of its future as basically selling cars into the Chinese market, is the leader on fuel cell technologies. It's because they are imagining a world in which the cost of this new infrastructure is diffused across hydrogen, uh, across heating, across power, and so the total costs of the system come down in that case, and therefore transportation will come down as well compared to what we're thinking of with EVs in, in a Western market. There's, there's no question that fuel is the silver bullet. We Jane, can, I, I would be remiss yeah. if, as the uh, company who's investing as much in hydrogen as any on the planet, if I didn't say something about hydrogen. Go for it. Um, you know, Shell is, is spending billions of dollars in, in a very bullish view on the way it can augment our, our needs. Um, there are a lot of really wonderful technologies, solar renewables, they meet a lot of needs. There are needs left over after any single technology is done. Hydrogen is wonderful because you can ship it, you can put it on planes, you can put it on boats. Uh, a solid liquid fuel uh, has many uses for energy intense use cases that we will need if, if our carbon goals are, are what they are. And, and I like the example, you know, you mentioned a very specific technology. The idea of baskets of technologies and policy that anticipates that is really critical. I think an elegant part of SB100 to bring it back is that they define carbon neutral. Uh, and that leaves the door open for anything that we may not even be able to imagine right now, such as interesting uh, technologies like you mentioned. Thank you. I do, I do think it's important to emphasize how important uh, fuel will be. A fuel that doesn't release carbon dioxide. Um, is going to solve a lot of problems. And I, I, I think another point about this is that, um, you know, this isn't a problem we're going to solve once and for all by the middle of the century. If we're lucky, we're going to get carbon out of the system by the middle of the century. But those not aren't, we're not going to stop developing technology at that point. We're not going to stop. And I, I think that, that really the point I'm trying to make is that we, we have a pragmatic problem right now for the next couple of decades. We need to be really pragmatic. And so I think what we haven't touched on here is a little bit about how, how ideology affects this solution. Because what you've been hearing from the panel is that, you know, all uh, variable renewable energy, if that's the only thing you're going to do, we're going to be probably have a hard time with reliability. It's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to use a lot of land. I think the figure, as I recall, is if we go with a, a broad portfolio, something like 400 gigawatts of solar, and if we try to stick to solar and wind and not do anything else, it's 800 gigawatts of solar and the, and the resulting landmass. So I think that one of the things that, um, uh, as we hear these comments, I think it's useful to put them into the, into the bin of are they, uh, it's all right, it's all right. It's all right. I, I live in a house with a three-year-old right now. I'm used to it. Um, the, 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 um, the, the, you know, kind of trying to listen to what you've been hearing from these panelists relevant to the two-decade problem versus relevant to, you know, the next hundred years. So another question over here. Hello, Anthony Diamond with Axiom Exergy. I'd be really interested to hear the panelists' uh, thoughts about how the electrification of the uh, vehicle uh, or transportation sector will either uh, make uh, achieving the SB 100 mandates more complex or support it. Uh, uh, Arnie, can you take that one? Uh, so first of all, it's, we, we don't have a choice. That's an essential part of the economy-wide transition, and we need to be ready for it. Uh, some of the scenarios that we've done looking at the economy-wide plan for California by 2050 see a growth in electric load of over 50%. So that's a lot of new load to serve. It makes it, we have to find a lot more sources of zero carbon energy power to, to uh, serve those new loads. Uh, I think the building loads, if we do building electrification as our way to get carbon out of buildings, are actually much harder to serve. They're harder to move around. They come during the winter time, which is the most constrained time, you know, this, this type of a week. So I'm, I'm, I worry a lot about how we serve those loads uh, for, for cars. They come with, they, they have mobile storage with them. So I'm not super optimistic about vehicle to grid using your car batteries, which you depend on for transportation to support the big giant grid. Maybe you'll get to do some of that. But I'm very optimistic about the idea that you can charge at a time when it's convenient to the grid. 
uh, and, and not charge at a time when the grid really needs the power to serve homes and lights and, and, and everything else. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the way that we can uh, integrate those two systems to help solve the broader uh, carbon problem. Sorry. Yeah, sure, just to add a couple of other ideas. One is that uh, battery second life uh, may have real benefits for the grid. So after you've you know, used it for your car, uh, it will come to like 80% uh, maximum capacity, and then they say, oh, it's done. Well, that's still a lot of capacity in that battery. Um, and, and I actually think it's worth trying to make the vehicle-to-grid part work, you know, to work with the auto manufacturers, because there will be a massive amount of storage in those cars. And to the extent that, that they can help make the grid operate more reliably, to the extent that you don't need to buy additional batteries, I, I think that could be helpful. Hi, uh, this is Harry. Um, so one question, as far as the uh, grid goes, I'm the victim of a small uh, uh, provider, and we're paying a lot of money for that. So, um, but as far as the, one thing we didn't hear uh, is transportation, right? We're talking about transportation, but we're still talking about cars. New York City, I was raised in New York, and, uh, you know, it has an amazing system that worked, as uh, for me as a consumer, right? I mean, even when I was 12 years old, I can get to Manhattan, Brooklyn, whatever. And this was built in the 1920s. I mean, like we're in 2019, and we are still tr struggling to build a commuter system where we could get off of our cars and get from point A to B. And there, every time there's a bill that's introduced to build a railroad or public transportation. There's special interests that come in and kill that bill. It, 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 I hate to say it, but some of, some of them are oil companies or car companies, and they kill these bills at local city levels, county levels. What are we doing about that? We're not talking about that, because that can save a lot of energy. I don't, <laughs> that's a great point. I, I don't know that our panel is prepared to talk about it. I mean, we have a lot of structural problems on transportation in the Bay Area, particularly. Yeah. But we're also not ready to, to densify our urban areas and build high rises so that we can actually be set up physically to take advantage of a dense transportation network either. So, Just, there, I mean, it's more than that, too, because I'm on the um, BAA QMD Science Advisory Board, and we presented with the high pollution corridors where the BAA QMD would like to restrict uh, development, right? Well, that's the transit oriented development corridors. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of conversation that, you know, the, I think one of the uh, statistics we have in, Cal in, um, in the United States in general is there are 85,000 governments in the United States. And so part of our problem is just trying to find ways to have those <coughs> pieces talk to each other. I don't remember how many transportation districts we have in the, in, in the Bay Area, but it's, I think it's like 15. It, 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 you know, it, we can't, we've got to change that. There has so, to be a change. So can I just uh, address that really quickly? I mean, I, I think it's a, oh, for lack of a better term, so a, an American problem. You know, I think we tend to be, you know, solve it ourselves, be independent, and things like shared public transportation system, I just don't think there's a tremendous amount of public support for them. I think it's really unfortunate. I think it's to our detriment. And I actually really worry that the same kind of thinking is going to allow us to weaken our electricity system and and these equity issues will really emerge. So I, I think it's we really have to look inside ourselves to to figure out is that the society we want to be or do we want to have more shared services? So uh, Tom, you have a I'll just comment? make the point that I think you're identifying a general problem with land use in America. Yeah. Land use is left to localities in this country. Uh, and, and these localities then, because no one really wants to be on the city council of some little podunk place except real estate people, uh, they are completely controlled by real estate people. This is as true here as it is up in, in Shasta County. But the fires, we're never going to solve the problems until we start to get control of that set of incentives. Yeah. And it's not going to happen at the local level. So we got a question back here. And then yeah, here. my name is Narayan. We talked a lot about on the generation side of uh, SB 100, right? We talked about the transition 
the pros, cons, difficulties because of policies, technologies, etc. What are the kinds of transitions that we need to make on the consumption side so that as the, as the population grows, the, curve, the two curves will meet so that way also it can meet the SB100 uh, goal. And maybe I'll build on that. Efficiency obviously has as a role, I, you know, I think California does have a proud legacy on efficiency where for decades it's increased, uh, reduced the consumption per um, average, average home. And there's a lot of programs that are in efficiency that should always play. Demand response has always been key. An exciting intersection of the need that you describe as well as technology and then policy is there are a lot of things that you can do from a flexibility perspective with, with demand. Um, all of these assets that are in the homes, whether they're, they're smart on wealthy people's homes or, or, uh, or, in, or not, to folks like us, if I can tap into those and I can actually reduce those at very efficient times, they're as valuable as any additional generation on the system or on, on the home. And often they're assets that have zero marginal cost to leverage. They're sitting there basically underutilized. Um, to build on, on, I think, maybe one of the themes Sally mentioned in your opening of if we could tap into the vast number of assets out there that are sitting there underutilized, you could bring down the cost with extremely small marginal cost. Um, and so I think it builds and reinforce, reinforces. Uh, that will increasingly be important on top of the traditional things like energy efficiency that are already a staple of, of the demand side. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, we should easily work on doubling the pace of energy efficiency improvements. So historically, it's been about 1% a year in improvement in the energy intensity. Um, why not double that? It makes decarbonization of the global energy system so much easier if we can do that. And uh, we had right here. Yep, yeah. Philip. Oh, or down over there. Okay. Sure. I'm Dan Marshall from Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I'm interested in the demand side. It seems like if we had variable demand pricing, for example, here we are at 6:30 p.m. Uh, when there's been no solar and no wind, maybe the cost per kilowatt hour should be three dollars. Uh, and if we did that, wouldn't a lot of other things fall into place? I believe we're going to time of use pricing, aren't we? I've never met an economist that wouldn't love the, the idea yeah. of real-time instantaneous spot prices for every square inch of, of the grid if we could do it. It's a pure, uh, elegant solution. And more often than not, you get a lot of legacy systems holding back. Um, uh, Arnie mentioned the, the art of, of rate making and trying to figure out who pays what. Uh, the art of billing is as... Uh, is laborious and challenging when you're working with systems that were created 30 years ago and to overhaul them to be able to do the exotic billing. Um, it's, it's complex. I do think that there is a one-way march towards more exposure of time-intensive pricing, um, and, and we would certainly argue for more and faster. You quickly find you're in the land of practicality versus theory, I think, is, is the challenge. So a lot of it. So the boss says we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Um, I guess it's sort of two questions, if I can get that in. One, I understand from uh, National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory, we have a lot of potential electric energy off offshore that we're not taking advantage of on the West Coast. And secondly, it's come up, for those of you who are local, about banning natural gas uh, new development. So I wonder how compatible is our infrastructure to hydrogen? Maybe I'll say a little bit about the first one, not the second one. Um, so the, California does have an, a great offshore wind resource. Our water is very deep offshore, so it has to be a special type of technology, basically floating platforms or something. Um, but, uh, but California has a big effort to uh, set the CEC to assess uh, corridors within the ocean um, offshore area that would be suitable. And some, some of the modeling that we've done has shown there's tremendous value to offshore wind because it also has a high capacity factor, like it might blow 60% of the time, uh, which is immensely beneficial. So I, that's, I, I'm really hoping that technology comes along and that we're able to implement policy measures that will allow people to do actual projects. Maybe I'll opine on the natural gas component of that. 
Shell has one of the largest natural gas businesses in the world, and I'm relatively new to Shell, but something that I've become proud of is our our executive who runs the national uh, natural gas business for Shell Global um, has stood up recently and said we would be delighted to uh, to migrate off the natural gas business. Um, it would be wonderful to go to carbon neutral as fast as, as we could. Um, there's no sacredness from, from companies, uh, at least from Shell. And the nuance, I think, comes from a comment that Arnie touched on earlier, which is if there was a, enough resources, uh, technologies, people, deployment to make the world green tomorrow, Shell has now, through its DNA, committed to that, to that world. There's a lot of parts in the world where it physically can't be done, um, all the coal plants in, in Asia. There's not enough renewable people deploying these assets to, to go clean tomorrow. Um, and so we often talk about natural gas as a bridge in ways to, yes, replace coal typically. Um, if it's appropriate in, in California for natural gas uh, to be a part of the mix, great. If, it, if it's not, uh, so be it. I think as a mechanism, we certainly think things like SB100 that says reduce the carbon intensity uh, is better because you could easily, say, have carbon capture next to natural gas and the net is, is the same. Um, it, ultimately, I want to advertise that Shell is, is moving, believes in the transition and believes that we're all in this together. Natural gas has a role to play, admittedly more in countries that are not named the United States than the United States. Uh, when it's appropriate here and it meets the societal goals here, uh, you know, we advocate fair uh, competition and, and reducing carbon as, as the core. Maybe I'll just make, uh, I'll add one, one final comment on that question because it t touches back on something that Jane said earlier. So I think for cars, it looks like the answer is electric vehicles, ba battery powered vehicles and not hydrogen fuel cells, right? But uh, uh, 10 years ago, that was a debate. I don't know that we know the answer yet for heating buildings. There's still a debate between fuel and power, which is the best source to heat buildings. Uh, there may be one answer in California with a relatively mild climate. We might be able to say here, yeah. heating buildings with electricity works really well. I don't know that it works as well in Minnesota or the Northeast or Europe, for that matter, or northern China. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know that. So I don't know that we know the answer to that yet. And when it individual, when three or four or seven of the eighty-five thousand government entities that Jane talked about, start making decisions on their own about that. I don't know that that's the optimal way to answer that question. I feel like we need to know more before we start doing things as draconian as bans on natural gas in new buildings, uh, despite how, how attractive they sound on the surface. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what you just said. And I'm going to weigh, oh, sorry. I'm going to weigh in a, a little bit more on that. I think that, you know, just to make it really simple, in California, wind and solar go down by 60 to 80 percent in the winter. And if we electrify heat, and go to all renewable energy, we don't have a solution that works. It absolutely does not work. And, we ha and that means that we're going to be stuck with using gas. So just saying uh, we decree we're not going to. This is the opposite side of the regulation piece. Regulation without the sufficient engineering, without sufficiently understanding that we need natural gas and natural gas storage because the pipelines carrying gas into California don't carry enough gas to meet the peak to load for heat. And if we're going to go try to switch that to um, renewable energy, when we need that heat the most, we're not going to have the renewable energy. So I, I think, Claire, I, I would love to give you just a shot. Do we have time to, because I know she, yeah, go ahead, Claire. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, I just wanted to add on the hydrogen infrastructure question, since that was the second part of your mm -hmm. question, correct? Mm -hmm. On the, yeah. So um, the U.S., has a very large natural gas infrastructure. Um, and I think a majority of it is actually carbon steel and uh, on the transmission side and polyethylene on the distribution side. And those are materials that could technically be converted or uh, repurposed for hydrogen. Um, I think the main barrier is actually the production of hydrogen. And so again, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, a wide set of technologies that could potentially produce this uh, this fuel, and then there are obviously other challenges. Hydrogen is, I think, a third of the energy density uh, to as natural gas. So you need more. You need other things like more compression. You need to change uh, certain parts of your pipeline system, and then and then there's the question of you know just the um, uh, how do you call it like. Uh, 
people's adoption, right? Like, do you, how, how will people react to end use appliance changes or, or just, you know, having hydrogen in their homes as opposed to natural gas? So it, it, it could mix in, but then it wouldn't be a carbon neutral, right? Yeah. In a, in a transition or in a hybrid system where you have hydrogen and, and electrification. So if you come away from this, uh, this erudite group here and uh, have a sense that uh, California is lucky, we have a lot going for us in doing this, this hard job, but we also have a lot of confounding problems to, uh, to solve. And uh, I think that the, the main thing I, I would always like a group like yourself to go away with is let's be pragmatic about this. We have to do it quickly. And uh, I'd like to give a round of applause for our speakers. I'd like to thank our speakers, Jane, Sally, Brian, Tom, Arnie, so much for sharing your perspectives with us so candidly. We appreciate it very much. Sorry we didn't have more time for questions this evening, but I appreciate your participation. Uh, we would like to present you with a very small token of our appreciation. It is the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Please, please wear it in good health. A uh, recording of this program will be available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel shortly, hopefully uh, within the next 24 hours. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but we hope that you will uh, share that if you found this discussion to be valuable, and we hope that you will find our offerings there to be a valuable resource in general. So thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>